testing okay yeah everyone can hear me right uh, why what the fuck <laughs> you haven't heard of the new batman trailer is it what oh chapter seven yeah we finished chapter six what the last thing we talked about was finishing chapter six i thought you wtf batman uh we are talking about we will be talking about chapter seven chapter six settled already yeah so if you remember right the end of chapter six was rolling motion uh we will we will discuss tutorial questions in chapter six later okay so see we, we were talking about this right or this rolling motion part and then i show you the animation and that is the end already okay so the next thing is chapter seven Uh, <laughs> yeah, we are accelerating. Kind of. Uh, we have ten chapters in this course. Uh, the rolling motion, right? Yeah. Uh, how the experiment proved that Earth is round? Oh, uh, it's like this, uh. So wait, uh, I forgot to bring my pencil. Because our Earth is. Uh, have a radius and we will actually use this radius in today's calculation uh, around 6,000 kilometers right so we have this right so um, so the earth is round have a radius of R right uh, I should full screen it make it bigger okay so um, and then in the experiment right uh, you have then the the person's name is Dan Olson so he he's living at a lake so this part is the lake um, the reason why we want a lake is because it's a uh, ocean, it's water, so there's no trees or hills blocking it. We he just observing a tree over here, right? So he's observing a tree over here. So if he raise the camera up, right, he can see the uh, some parts of the tree. But if he lowers the camera, right, uh, the this part is blocking the view of the tree. So that's why you can um, from the camera high up, you lower the camera, right? The tree cannot be seen at the when it's lower. Uh, yeah. So um, he explained it much better than me, la. Uh, if you can, yeah, you can see YouTube, right? So, uh, when you uh, you can go to YouTube, you search Dan Olson Flat Earth, and it's a very interesting video. But it's one hour <laughs> plus long, right? He talks about a lot of things. Uh, the this camera part is just the beginning part only. Yeah. So. Um, yeah so that so this is about the flat so this is why i'm showing you the video because we are starting on gravitation today okay so um i will i will give you your uh, exam marks very soon um, and yeah so i see a lot of people uh, struggling with the uh, exam but uh, don't worry okay so um I will adjust the final exam based on everybody's skill. So if you're doing well, congratulations. Uh, but if you're not uh, doing well also, uh, it doesn't mean um, whether you do well or not, right? It doesn't mean you should relax now because the final, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. So I will, I will adjust for the final exam. The link for the document. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, don't cry, don't cry. Okay. The, don't worry, the final exam will be better. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, and, uh, uh, so, and the idea is this, right? Whether you do well or not, uh, you still have to study for the final, right? So, um, yeah, uh, that, that is, even if you do well also, <laughs> um, now it's everywhere. Ayo. Yeah, don't be sad, don't be sad. Okay, so, uh, now we talk about more uh, fun things and also I think um, around the break time I will also show you uh, we should also talk about the assignment right so uh, don't forget about the assignment yeah so the final um, I will try to focus more on chapter 6 to 10 but um, obviously right the um, to solve question in 6 to 10 we also need some knowledge about Newton's law some knowledge about momentum these kinds of things okay and also um 
yeah so if the universe yeah uh um uh, because everything is u using newton's law la, right so um and also you will we will see later also uh there's a topic in question seven but that still you need to use moments of inertia even also it's about the oscillating pendulum so this type of situation okay um yeah so that is about it right so um um uh, anything else to tell you? So the assignment things I will tell you um, around the break time, and we should start. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. Don't cry, don't cry. Uh, no need to cry. No need to cry. Uh, like a sad cat. Okay. So um, yeah. So now let's talk about a new topic, which is chapter seven, gravitation. Okay. Uh, so so this the the first few things about this chapter is still kind of easy the difficult part is towards the back uh, and yeah so a lot of you guys are not very comfortable with calculus yet right so only at the back of this chapter will involve calculus but besides that um, Newton's law is something that everyone may have already studied in the high school right the GMM over R square that kind of thing so we are learning it again and um, and we shall see okay so um, so yeah and this is the lesson after the midterm right so we will again try to be go a bit relaxed and um and go a bit more slowly uh so we are kind of within schedule so that's fine right so we're going to talk about chapter seven and we want to talk about the newton's laws of gravity right so uh yeah so we're going to talk about gravity and uh, we have been talking about gravity in the previous chapter as mg, right? So the f the weight due to the Earth, and here we will realize that this uh, equation, the weight equals to mg, is only true approximately close to the surface of the Earth. We will actually calculate this, right? And what we want to do is to calculate the general Newton's law of uh, gravitation. So the story goes like this. Um, how did Newton come up with the laws of gravitation? Before Newton, right, there was already uh, Kepler's law, so uh, slightly earlier than Newton. And at that time, people were very interested in studying how the planets orbit around the sun, right? So uh, astronomers like Kepler, uh, Tycho Brahe, and, uh, and, and many, many others, they, they have very detailed records about how the planets orbit around the sun. Okay, so um, so before Newton came along, right? We already actually have Kepler's law. So uh, the the story of Kepler is actually kind of very interesting. So um, before Kepler, right? There was Tycho Brahe. So uh, Brahe, right? So Brahe is like the boss of Kepler. So he, they were at um, I think it was called the Uraniburg Observatory. I forgot the spelling. Uh, I think it was in Denmark, right? Uh, and then uh, Kepler was the staff there or student, uh, or, or the, the, the second person there, right? So this is Johannes Kepler, right? And um, yeah, so I just want to tell the story because it's kind of funny, um, but also sad, uh, the story of how Brahe died. So I don't know if anyone knows how the Tycho Brahe, right? Yeah, Tycho Brahe. Uh, so uh, he, so he was the director of this observatory. So he got a lot of stuff there. Kepler was one of them. They kept all the records of how the planets orbits around the sun, right? And the story of how he died, right, is actually kind of embarrassing for Bra. Is because um, it was he was invited to an event with the royal king or something, right? And then they were having a dinner, and then because it's a king and l a lot of VIP guests there, right? So he felt it's rude to like leave the table to go to the toilet so he just sat there and and uh, and just waited right so uh, even though he's very uncomfortable and because of that right he got an uh, infection uh, so I yeah so he got an infection and then two weeks later he died uh, because he's too embarrassed to go to the toilet right so uh, kind of sad story how he died but uh, eventually Kepler took over Right, and then he continued the observation. So from Brahe, from Bra to Kepler, they observed the motions of the planet over many, many years, and then they collected the data. And based on this huge amounts of data, he he summarized all the data in terms of three laws. So um, I'm gonna mention them briefly. 
because we can actually use Newton's law to derive Kepler's laws. Okay, so from uh, Kepler, we have Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Uh, planetary motion. Okay, so here we want um, uh, this law is discussing how the planets orbit around the sun. And right now, uh, since Newton, we will know this is because of gravity, but at that time, it's just based on observation and based on data. And what they observe is that uh, each planet, they, the motion of the planet is almost circular, but he recognized that more generally it's a shape of an ellipse. So each planet uh, moves in an elliptical orbit. And then the sun uh, is on one of the focus. Okay, so uh, yeah, so do you know what the I what are the features of an ellipse? If you don't know, let me remind you. Okay, you can plot the ellipse on the x y plane, Cartesian axis, right? And then we uh, for ellipses we have two focus. Okay, so we call this f one, and then we call this f two, and then the ellipse is having this type of shape. Okay, so the distinguishing feature of the ellipse is that um, the distance uh, d1 plus d2 is constant. Okay, so this is how you trace the uh, shape of the ellipse. And then uh, over here is called the minor axis. And then over here, this distance is called the major axis. Okay, and then we have a special case. If uh, minor axis is equal to the major axis, we get a circle. Okay, so a circle is just a it's just a ellipse where the major and minor axis are the same, so it's perfectly round, right? But um, for other orbits, the major axis maybe is longer, much much longer than the minor axis. Okay, he. He died because of losing hair. Uh, well, yeah, his bladder exploded is a more accurate <laughs> description. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we can look. Uh, maybe we can look at the Wikipedia to f to have a more detailed story. But this was the story that was uh, told to me by my lecturer. Okay. Uh, when I learned it. So, um, uh, so now I'm telling it to you guys. Uh, so this is Kepler's first law. So the motion of the planet is following the shape of an ellipse. Right. So that's the first law. And then the second law is about the time taken. So the second law is this: a line. So the oh yeah, uh, the sun is located at one of the ellipses. This is the planet, and then the planet will orbit around the Earth, right? So our our Earth will orbit around the sun once a year, three hundred and sixty-five days. Okay. So um, a line from uh, the sun to planet uh, sweeps out. Equal areas uh, in equal times. Okay, so what do we, what do we mean by that? So let's say let's draw another ellipse to demonstrate this situation. Okay, so the sun is on one of the focus, right? And let's say right, a planet is here. Okay, and let's say how long does it take to orbit around the sun in two months? So let's say two months, right? Within two months, the planet goes from here to here, right? So two months. Okay, so the time taken is two months, and then from here you can actually calculate the area uh, after traveling for two months. So um, and then if we consider another case, right? The planet is from here, and then it after two months is also here. So from here we can calculate another area. This is also two months. And if both are the same time, uh, the conclusion is that the two areas will be the same. Okay, so the consequence of this is that if you are at the region that is nearer to the sun, right, you have to go faster to cover the same area. If you are much much further away, you you can go slower. It will give you the same area. So from here we conclude that if you are nearer to the sun, and then the orbit will go faster. And then if you are further away from the sun, your orbit will go slower. 
So that is kind of expected, right? Um, if you can imagine, now we know of gravity, when we are nearer to the gravitational source, the motion, is the gravity is stronger, so it will pull you, it will go faster. And it's because uh, if you are further away, the potential energy is higher. If you are nearer, the potential energy is lower, it converts into kinetic energy, right? So this is um, Kepler's second law, okay? Then the third law is, is there space? Yeah, S the third law is very simple, okay? The third law is the period of the motion. So the according to Kepler's law, um, the period, that means how long does it take to complete one round, uh, is proportional to the major axis to the power 3 over 2, okay? So, um, yeah, we can sort of, um, uh, uh, calculate this uh, later we will calculate in exact detail N not just proportionality but even the constants also we we can calculate using Newton's law so uh, from here we see that the larger the ag major axis that means the larger the orbit the further away the you're orbiting the Sun the longer it takes to orbit around the Sun right so that is also very normal uh, our earth takes about our earth takes one year to orbit the Sun the planet Jupiter I think it takes 16 years right and Saturn is like 20 plus years and things like that uh, Pluto is orbiting very very far away from the Sun it takes 200 years to orbit uh, around the Sun okay so that is uh, Kepler's law right so one so one thing I want to mention it about this is that um, is that Kepler's law is empirical Okay, um, yeah, so as physics student, we should understand what is the meaning of this word empirical. Empirical means it's the law that you conclude based on observation, observational data, so it's inferred from data. Okay, and the job of a physicist, if you are a theoretical physicist, is to be able to um, derive the laws, not by studying the data, but coming from some physical principle right so starting with some uh, law so in the case of this chapter we start from Newton's equation of the gravity and from there we can derive the three Kepler's law okay so that is how the two uh, scientific theories can support each other right one side you have observation which is by doing experiments or observation when it comes to cosmology and things like that right observe or experiment and then the other side is the theory Right, so once we, we are able to do both sides uh, correctly, then we are able to understand a phenomena very, very well. Okay, so that is the ultimately the goal of many physical theories, is what we want to do. Okay, um, why A2 equals to A1? Yeah, yeah, so that's the thing. Um, we don't know why yet. Kepler also don't know why. He just look at the data, eh? Like after two months, this is the area. Then on this side, after two months, is also the area. And right now, we don't know yet. This is what we want to explore in this chapter. Uh, yes, this is the e yeah. That's the equation of the ellipse. Yeah. Uh, so um, we we probably won't be using this equation. Uh, maybe later. Um, it's, it it will be in a part that is not compulsory. Uh, optional part because there is a lot of complicated math to derive from from Newton's law to the equation of the ellipse it's actually possible to derive but uh, that equation is a bit messy to, to do it okay so yeah so Kepler's law are empirical so what we want to do is we want a theory right so we want a theory and this theory is the Newton's law of gravity so uh, let's talk about Newton's law of gravity. Okay. Um, I think everyone has seen this in high school before. Right? It's being taught in high school, right? So, uh, at least when, when I'm in the high school. Uh, so, it's, the equation is very straightforward. The magnitude of the force. Um, yeah, so in high school, even though you learn it, right? Um, Probably your high school is not very careful about the vectors and yeah from from Partially from the midterm and quiz also uh, Everyone is not very good with vectors yet, but right now right um, at right now at this level We should be taking care of the vector as well, but the magnitude 
is um, so m1 m2 over r squared okay so this is the magnitude of the force that means if, if I have an object with mass m1 and another object I have mass m2 so this object will exert a gravitational force right so m2 will experience a force coming from m1 the magnitude is this m1 also will experience the same force this is like partially related to Newton's third law okay and then if the distance is r right whatever kilometers is divided by r square so the further apart the two objects the weaker the force if you are very very near the force keeps becoming stronger okay and it depends on m1 times m2 right so if m1 or m2 whoever is larger the force is also stronger right and uh, then there's a g here so this g is an important physical constant so it is 6.67428 times 10 to the minus 11 uh, meter cube kg minus 1 second minus 2 so this is what we call the Newton's constant a uh, gravitational constant okay so this one uh, so this one the value of this constant you we can either calculate this by observing data or by doing the experiment okay so this is Newton's law Mitham has uh, ve vector um, don't have me got vector right like all this uh, thing uh, quiz the or quiz have vector yeah Never mind, uh, suddenly I can't remember anything. Okay, should focus on the gravity part, right? So um, now, this is the magnitude of the force. And what I was talking about is we should take care of the, the vectors as well, right? So then we, we use the same method that we did last time. Uh, free body diagram. Yeah, definitely got vector. Once we draw free body diagram, we need to take into account the direction. Okay, so the free body diagram of uh, mass 1. So if I look at object mass 1, right, what is the force acting by... Uh, um, what is the force uh, experienced by M1? Let's say there's no other external force, right? No friction, no tension, only these two things. So there is one force coming through here. This is the gravitational force. And then the free body diagram of uh, M2, right? So M2 is over here. And then you will experience an equal and opposite force in this direction. So uh, force is a vector, right? This only tells you the magnitude. Uh, you need to specify the direction as well so uh, right now um, it is important to learn how to write down the direction this is maybe everyone knows in high school already so the direction is something new so let me teach you how to write down the direction okay so let's say right so let's say uh, let's focus on let's focus on this uh, free body diagram okay so let's say free body diagram we 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 um, draw a coordinate Uh, system with uh, M1 at the origin okay so this is how you get the free body diagram of M1 okay so I got M1 over here right so I got M1 is here and then it experiences a force so like this right so what we want to do now is to uh, figure out the vector equation for this force we know the magnitude already we just need to know the direction so depending on the question right we the qu from the question we can always see where is m2 from m2 maybe we can get the height and then we can get the distance here so we can get the angle correct and then from that we can calculate the x and y component of that force so um, from here we got uh, x component of the force is uh, fx right so fx is well i got the magnitude and then uh, the x component it will be the cosine theta right so it's just gmm over r square cos theta and then the y component is fy is gmm r square sine theta okay yeah okay so um yeah basically basically this two things right so is so uh 
See, that's the that's the situation, right? It, like between here and uh, midterm, like the when we talk about it here, it feels very easy. But uh, when it comes to answering questions, everybody forget all the all the concept, which felt very easy when you are hearing it in the uh, in the lecture time, right? Um, uh, yeah. So this is very common. So just try not to just be careful about these things. Okay, so we got the x component and then got a y component. So with the x and y component, we can write the vector equation, right? So the vector equation is fx uh, in the i direction and then fy in the j direction. So right now, I'm ignoring the z direction, uh, just to make it simple, right? So I have uh, these two equations. So if I put everything in, right, you realize that uh, I can actually simplify. So fr squared cos theta i and then gmm over r squared. Oh, yeah. I, I use a different notation, so, so big M and then small m, okay, and then sine theta. And then we, we realize that this part can be factorized. And then I got cos theta i and then sine theta j, okay. So this part, this is the magnitude, so I can uh, put it aside. This is a vector, but the length is 1. So this is a unit vector. Okay, and if it's a unit vector, we give it this symbol, okay, uh, such that the magnitude of this is having a length 1, so the magnitude of f is all stored inside here. So we can write a vector expression for the force, right, so for this case, right, so if I have an object of mass, um, okay, so let's use m1 here, and then I use m2 here, and I see that the force is for m1, right, uh, force experienced by M1 is having a force equation that is a magnitude G M1 M2 over R square and then the R unit vector. Okay, so R unit vector is a vector that is pointing from the origin and the direction is towards M2. Okay. And then now we look at M2, right? So how about M2? The force experienced by M2 now is this way. So it's just the opposite. So force experienced by M2 Okay. Uh, force experienced by M2 is the opposite. Okay, so everyone follow so far, right? Just how, just um, yeah. We just need to make sure how to write things in terms of vectors. Okay, so um, yeah. So again, it's like you see now it's very easy, but we answering question everybody forget. Actually, it's always the same method all the time, right? Um, when you have a vector force, right? So you need to figure out what is the magnitude and the direction. So there's so many ways to determine the magnitude and direction, right? You can do it the way that's convenient to you. Sometimes people just do it separately in X and Y components separately the whole time. That is also fine. Uh, but usually for gravitation, right? Um, because gravitation, everything is in the R radial direction. So X and Y components is not so convenient. It, it, it's possible to be done, but this writing this is much shorter than writing this twice all the time right so that is one way it's more convenient so uh, it's good to get used to writing forces in this in this way okay so everyone follow following so far okay huh? uh, okay so if not let's look at how we uh, apply this as an example okay so 7.1.1 why f is in the r direction yeah so literally right the force between these two right so what is the force um, pointing uh, m1 is the origin so m1 is in the origin then what is the direction of this force is towards m2 right, what is the direction of this force is away from m2 towards the origin so it's in the radial direction okay so let's look at example 7.1.1 Okay, so let's read the question briefly. Uh, 
I I didn't I didn't say radius. I just said that this is a unit vector. We give it a symbol r hat. So this r r hat vector is given by this expression. Right? No one said radius. The radius is here r square. Right? So it's the radius square. Okay. So example seven point one point one. Um, I have we have a three star system shown in this figure. So the figure is over here, right? Uh, one, two, three stars. So these two have a mass big M, which is the same, and this is a lighter star, which having this mass over here. So what we want to do is basically to calculate the total force exerted on the small star. So we just look look at the free body diagram for the small star. Okay. So let's um. Let's record down the information. So the mass of the small star is uh, 1 times 10 to the 30 kg. The two big stars are the same mass. So it's 8 times 10 to the power 30 kg. And then if we draw the axis, right? since we are focusing on the small star, uh, we put the small star at the origin. So the, our small m is here. And then uh, I have a big M here and then another big M over here, right? So big M and then big M, okay? So the distance from this star to this star is R1. From here to here is R2. Okay, so, um, oh, I call this R2 and this is R1. So from the diagram, we can see that the from here to here is 2 times 10 to the power 12. So R1 is 2 times 10 to the power 12 meters. And this distance is also 2 times 10 to the power 12. Which means to say that how to get R2. right? So how to get R2? Well, we use the Pythagoras theorem. So R2 is 2 times 10, 12 square, 2 times 10, 12 square, square root. So if you work it out, you just get uh, 8 times 10 to the power 24 square root. So it is just... Um, Actually, we need the we just need the square, right? So we square this. So it's just eight times ten to the power twenty-four. So this is just equals to twice of r one square. Okay, r one square is four ten to the twenty-four. So there's another factor of two to give you eight, right? So r two square is twice of r one square. Okay. So now let's look at the forces, right? So we are drawing a uh, m one free body diagram. And what is the force experienced by M1? So there's this mass here, so it will experience a gravity that is attracting M1 towards this direction. So I'm going to call this uh, F1. It is a vector. And then it is also experiencing another force, which is F2, which is another vector, right? And then the angle from here, we can see that it's 45 degrees, right? So uh, 45 degrees because this is the um, same length, right, equal uh, length, even though I didn't draw it properly. So we can write down the vector expressions for these two. So what is the force? So yeah, magnitude everybody knows, right? It's just gmm over r square, okay? But what is the direction? Okay, direction is the cosine theta plus sine theta. Over here, the this force is perfectly horizontal, so it's only in the i purely in the i direction. Do you agree? Right, and then the distance is r one square. So and then the small m here, the big m here. How about the second force? So the second force is g m m over uh, r two square, and then what is the direction? So the horizontal component is cos forty five degrees. And then the vertical component is sine, 45 degrees. Okay. And then uh, we have R2 squared. So we have shown that R2 squared is just 2 times R1 squared. That will make our calculation easier. So I have the expression for F2 now, which is just uh, GMM over R1 squared. And then I got half cos 45 I plus half sine 45 j right so i purposely make it so the factors are the same so later it will easy to calculate right then i have uh f1 
and I have F2. So these are the two forces experienced by little m. Then what is the net force? Okay, so net force experienced by the little m is just F1 plus F2. Very easy, right? So I have these two already, just plus them together, right? So the I component, together with the I component, I can plus together. So uh, both, everybody has a factor of R1 square. So the x component plus x component is 1 plus half, correct or not? Yeah, half cos 45 degrees in the i direction. And then there's only a 1j component here. So it's half sine 45 degrees in the j component. Okay, so actually I'm writing all in symbols, but all the numbers we know already. So you can actually uh, calculate. So at the end, if you calculate everything right, uh, you get 1.806 times 10 to the power 26 in the i direction after you simplify everything and then 4.71 times 10 to the power 25 in the j direction and the force is in newtons of course okay so that is how we determine the net force in radius in radius I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, the r vector, this is the unit vector in the r direction. Oh, okay. It looks very easy. Oh, okay. If it's very easy, then good. Right? So that is, um, the vector is in r direction. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the radial, the unit vector in r direction. Because, right, um, uh, um, yeah, so uh, any vector, yeah, this one is important because we should get used to it. Uh, like any vector, right, I have magnitude and direction, right? So any vector I have, um, let's say a vector A, right? So the length of A is the length here, and then the direction, right, is uh, some direction R. So we can always write this as uh, magnitude and direction. So a vector is just uh, a, and then the direction. Okay. So the direction is of course uh, r hat is cos theta i plus sine theta j. So that my a, so that you can f uh, a cos theta i plus sine theta j. And then I've got a cos theta i plus a sine theta j. And this is where we got uh, my x component, right? And then this has got my y component. Okay. Actually, we have been using this uh, a bit here and there before last time. Um, but we only, f yeah, so we focus on the x and y component, right? But right now, uh, all we're doing is to factorize the magnitude out and then because this is a special, so this one we use it quite often, so for short we write this as A. So this vector over here. Okay, so the length of the unit vector is just cos square theta plus sine square theta. It's just one. So it's a unit vector. Okay. Uh, the f's direction, yeah, yeah, correct. So... Yeah, so everything is consistent, right? Uh, the unit vector is just horizontal i in this case, so f is pointing here. And then f2 is uh, cos 45 horizontally and sine 45 vertically, right? So that is the two components of the vector. And, and the direction of r will automatically give you the direction of f. Okay, and it depends on where you put as the origin. Okay, any other questions so far? Okay, yeah, so if everyone is okay, then uh, if I answer all your questions, then let's go to the next thing, uh, which is about satellite orbits. Uh, satellite orbits.
Yeah, so I'm sure everyone is familiar, right? Uh, right now, our Earth has many, many satellites orbiting around it. It's for communication. The main reason is for communication purposes. Sometimes it's for weather. Some satellite is orbiting around the Earth to observe the weather so that we can predict what is the future weather. And sometimes for different countries, you got the spy satellite, right? So one country will launch a satellite so that they can look down into another country and spy and see what they are doing. Okay, so uh, that is also another uh, purpose of satellite. And the common, uh, another purpose of satellite is the GPS. So why do we have all these GPS maps and ways? How can they work, right? It's because um, we are communicating with the GPS satellite to calculate our actual position. Okay, so, so satellite is very important in everyday life. And right now we want to understand how do satellites work. Okay, so... Uh, this is what we want to understand today. Uh, how or why do satellites orbit the Earth? Okay, so yeah. Uh, this one is kind of like a projectile motion. Or oh, really, <laughs> use a satellite to crash police building oh so let the satellite fall from the sky and then crash into building is it that's interesting yeah uh starlink <laughs> okay so how do we uh how do we calculate the motion of a satellite in if you recall chapter two right we did learn projectile motion so if we are talking about near the earth's surface We did projectile motion. Okay, and how did we do projectile motion? So near the Earth's surface, right? If we are near the Earth's surface, the ground is flat, and then uh, if we start from some initial height, right? Um, we let's say the we start with some initial horizontal velocity, and then in in fact, uh, this was when we still had physical class, right? I launched the game, and then I I uh, show you how it works. Right, and then uh, it will the projectile motion will be in the shape of a parabola. Right, if you increase your horizontal speed, it will go a bit further. Right, so if you increase it even more, it will go even more, even more further. Right, so this is a higher initial speed, and then this is lower initial speed. Okay, so this was when we are talking about near the Earth's surface. Right, so near the Earth's surface, so the ground is flat. Then, as I as I have showing you part the reason why I showing you this video just now, right, is that if you go far enough, right, like very far lake, the Earth is actually round. So when the Earth is round, what how how would the projectile motion uh, look like? So, um, so yeah, so let's draw the round shape of the Earth. Uh, big circle, something like this, right? So let's say I start a projectile at some initial uh, height, right? So if I start at some initial height, it's going to be launched, right? So it's going to launch. Uh, if the speed is very low, so it's like pro uh, parabola, right? If I increase the speed, it will it will still fall down later. So it's kind of similar to this, but you zoom out, right? If you zoom out, you get this situation, right? So if you launch a bit more further, it will fall down a bit further. So you can imagine for satellite orbits, right, is that if you launch at a speed that is fast enough, okay, so if you launch it fast enough, you go further away, right, so it will try to fall to the Earth, but the Earth is curving away at the same time. So if the Earth is curving away, it never get a chance to drop on the ground, right, it will just continue trying to fall, but every time it's continue to fall, the Earth will bend away, right, so it will bend away continuously, and continuously until, uh, since there's no chance to hit the Earth, so it will just start back from the initial position. And since it's continuing here, so it will continue going around orbit. So this is how the orbits of the Earth, uh, this is how the Earth, uh, the Earth or satellite orbits the Earth. So you just try to launch something with a fast enough initial speed, that's, that's why they need rockets, right? So you use the rocket to launch it at a fast enough speed, and then um, if it's fast enough, it will, it, will, it will never get a chance to hit the ground. Huh? Really? Uh? Wow. 
interesting. <laughs> okay, interesting. Yeah. So, um, so basically, yeah, this is the um, how the satellite orbits work, right? And to make contact with Kepler's law, right? Kepler's law is to say that, yeah, when when the Earth orbits, uh, every time we have satellite orbits, it will, should be generally the shape of an ellipse. So the circle, if I orbit th in this way, it becomes a circular motion. So a circle is an ellipse. But even this types of shape, right? This type of shape is also like ellipse. It's just that the ellipse is um, because the motion stops once it hit the ground. But let's say the Earth is compressed to a smaller size, right? And then it will the, the full ellipse should be taking this shape. Right, so this ellipse will be taking this shape. Okay, and, and so on and so forth. Right, so um so it's still consistent with Kepler's orbits. The screen not moving. Uh. Can you see my screen now? Uh, how about everyone else? So only Charles is it? Oh, rejoin. Uh. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So if, if only one person not moving, then rejoin. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I, I'll be the one that rejoin. Huh, really? Uh? Oh, um, let me reshare the screen. Uh. Let me reshare the screen. Wait. Uh. Uh, I think it's not Wi-Fi. It's, it's, the, it's the software, yeah. It's the Teams. Okay, I'm sharing again. Can you see now? Maybe Linux. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, Teams is Microsoft, right? And this is Linux. Good now, huh? Okay, great. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so this is how the uh, projectile motion works. Okay, so this is page five. Okay, so um, yeah, so let me write what I've just explained uh, by Kepler's law. Uh, all all cases are parts of an ellipse, and then the center of mass of the earth is one of the focus so this is the center mass of the earth right yes. so um, as usual right uh, once you calculate the center of the mass we can just treat everything at the center of the mass right, and ignore the size of the earth okay so the size of the earth is only here is only there to block the motion but if the earth is having the same mass but has a smaller radius same center of mass, then everything is still the same, so it's capable of uh, orbiting around there. Yeah, Linux and Microsoft got problem. It's because the different architecture, la. yeah. And when you when you have the Linux version of Microsoft app, you need a lot of work to make it fit to one another because the structure is different. Yeah. So consider quite lucky that Teams got a Linux version so that I can continue using Linux over here. What's ARM structure? ARM structure. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, so the next thing is to actually do some calculations uh, because Microsoft Lao Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't, Microsoft is 
I think because I'm too used to Linux, right? I'm not very comfortable using Microsoft. It's a bit slow. Some things are making it more less convenient, and things are I, f I feel more convenient if I'm on the Linux. So we're gonna consider a uh, satellite in uniform circular orbit around the Earth. And we will calculate some things using Newton's laws. Laoya, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I leave it to you to explain. <laughs> it's a Malaysian language. So let's go a bit further away, right? So let's say my Earth is here, and uh, my Earth is here, and the mass of the Earth is big M, and then I have a satellite orbiting the Earth. So uh, the mass of the satellite is small m, so it's going in a circular orbit. Okay, so circular orbit is easier to calculate than ellipse. So let us start with circular first. Okay, and then how do we calculate the motion of the orbit? Let us study the motion. So we look at the satellite free body diagram. So the what are the forces acting on the satellite? There's only one force, right? Which is the force of gravity. So for this case, we um, it's enough to just look at the magnitude because the direction is the radial direction, right? So this is the force due to gravity. And the net force by Newton's second law, right? The net force acting on the object is mass times acceleration, okay? What is the net force? There's only one force. So it's only GMM over R squared. And uh, this is a circular motion, so A is V squared over R, uh, R, the radius of the uh, motion, right? So on both sides, we got the M, so we can cancel M on both sides. We can cancel one R over here, and then we find that uh, V squared is, everything cancelled already, right? So I'm just left with GM over R, okay? So the speed or the, yeah, the speed, or the magnitude of the satellite velocity is the square root of gm over r. It's independent of the satellite mass. Okay, so um, yeah, so from here we conclude that we got this formula, right? Okay, so we can actually see how is this consistent with Kepler's law because this is the speed and this is a uniform circular motion. So from the from the uniform circular motion, right? We can actually calculate the period. Because let us call T to be the period. Okay, the period means time taken to complete one round. Okay, so how long does it take to go one round? Okay, so that is the period. So if this T is the period, then the V is equal to uh, 2 pi R over the time. Right, so the total distance divided by the total time which is just 2 pi r over t and comparing to this equation we have uh, gm over r the square root okay then we can easily see if I square both sides of the equation 4 pi square r square over t square is equal to gm over r and then simplify even further I have t square is equal to 4 pi square r3 over gm so the period itself is if I take the square root back I got 2 pi and then I got uh, r3 over gm the square root in other words what have we found we found 2 pi over the square root of gm and then r cubed square root is r to the power of 3 over 2 right so we, what we, did we say about Kepler's law so according to the Kepler's law the period is major axis 3 over 2 pi. So if it's a circle, the major axis is just the diameter, right? So the, and then the radius is half of the diameter. So it's still, we got this relation over here, right? So this is Kepler's uh, third law confirmed. The period is proportional to major axis uh, to the power of 3 over 2. Or in other words, the period is proportional to the uh, uh, 2 times the radius to the power 3 over 2 so your t is proportional to r to the power 3 over 2 okay 
So see, starting from Newton's law, right? This is Newton's second law and then Newton's law of gravitation. So from Newton's stuff, we can actually derive uh, Kepler's law, right? And Kepler, remember, was what he did was empirical. He, he concluded this based on just looking at the data and then try to guess an uh, equation. From, but from here, we not, no need to guess. We just derive everything from theory. So that is how we um, uh, support the theory even further. Looks so nasty. <laughs> Yeah, so the power, yeah, the power 3 over 2. I suppose so. Nasty. Yeah, but it's no choice, right? It's the law of physics, so we can't change the power. Well, from here, we can conclude a few things. Uh, uh, from here, for example, right, if uh, the t is proportional to the power of 3 over 2, so this is a exponent that is larger than 1, that means the larger of when r is larger, r to the power three over two um, is ev uh, even larger, right? So we either we look at three over two or we look at these two equation, right? So let's let's collect the two together. What time is it now? Okay, so uh, so I have two equivalent equations over here. Okay, uh, so from here we found that, um, well, uh, large, we conclude that for large r, so if a satellite is orbiting at a larger distance r, right, then we get the, well, larger r will get a slower speed. And then, of course, slower speed means a longer period. Okay, and then for a small r, for small r, we get a faster speed. And then uh, we get a shorter period. <laughs> Not integer be like this. Yeah, <laughs> E3 pi 5. I mean, physicist nightmare, so because if you get the wrong value for pi, you also get all the answers wrong, right? It's just like e equals to three. Yeah. Well, we never let e equals to three. We just keep it as e, and then we just leave it there. That's that will be even better, right? So we don't have to make it easier. Just leave it as e, and then that's fine. So, uh, yeah. So one last thing before we break, uh, uh, because. We kind of talked about this in the first class, right? The dark matter problem. So now we have come to here already. Now we got the equation. So I can elaborate uh, more detail about the dark matter problem. Right? Remember in the first class, we talked about this. Right? So the dark matter problem is for like the galaxy, right? So um, uh, we have the galaxy, like um, how to explain? Uh, yeah, so the cent uh, our sun is orbiting around the center of some galaxy, right? And then uh, in our galaxy, there's many, many stars, right? Many, many stars, uh, all orbiting in the circular motion, right? And if we follow this equation, right, we can calculate the speed of the star against the distance away from the center. So the distance from center, of the galaxy and then the speed of the star so we got v right and then our current theory right is uh, over r squared so over r squared will be like um something like this right so something like this and then uh if you're inside the galaxy right then the 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 total mass will be different so it should be expect to lower down as well Okay, so it should be like this, right? So this is our theory uh, based on our uh, calculation, right? But the, the reason why we have a dark matter problem is that what is observed, right, is actually not like this. It's like something like this. So it's not consistent with our equation. 
and right now we don't know why. Uh, why is this? Why is this the case? Right. So why is the the stars outside the galaxy orbiting faster than what we expect? Because uh, we're talking about Kepler's law and Newton's law all the time, right? So if you're further away from the center, your orbit should be slower. But right now, what we observe in many, many, all the galaxies is that when you're further away, the speed doesn't slow down, even though stars who are very far away from the center. So that is the dark matter problem. Our galaxy center, yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, um, uh, I, yeah, so right now I think it's time to take a break. So let's take a 10 minute break. And then I will answer any questions over here. Uh, I will look at the chat uh, as we break. Okay, so let's stop recording. Test. Okay, any other question? Okay, so... Yeah, just trigonometry. What's this? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm supposed to y talk about the assignment, right? So let's go to the assignment. Okay, so... Uh, assignment. So I put an example here already, but uh, let me remind you of the assignment that you're supposed to do, right? So there are uh, questions. You can choose a topic that you want to answer. Um, you can choose from this list, but uh, some of you already proposed your own topic to me. So if you want to solve a separate problem, uh, just let me know. And then, uh, and then I think in a few weeks' time, I just I will just take a poll to see what question everyone is solving now. Okay, uh, our deadline is fifteen January. It's basically the last day of our semester, and yeah, so uh, you can choose one topic to focus on and try to solve it. So I will show you an example of an assignment. You don't have to follow this format exactly. Just yeah, just do something that looks nice. Uh, this one, because I take up so much space here, so I, in total it becomes six, six pages. So just um, describe the problem, talk about it briefly, and then do, uh, do something to, to explore a question. So you don't have to, uh, don't be scared about this. Uh, I, I, I do it in a more advanced level because I'm also interested in this topic. So I, I was exploring this for myself and then I did some calculations. Um, then got some conclusions over here then yeah uh, so I, I will leave it up to you to see how you will um, uh, it's flexible uh, so see how you can explore this so you can download and check it out for yourself and what's that? Um, I, I use a software called IPE so IPE is very nice. Yeah. Uh, the latest code for this, okay? Yeah, I will share. Maybe I'll upload it here also. Yeah, but the latex not compulsory. Uh. You can... Oh, um, the lat is recorded, so you can watch the recording. I will I will get the recording from Darren and, and, and share it again. Yeah, so... Uh, go place to is IPE. So um, yeah, I that, let me show you the IP. You can install it on Linux or Windows. So this is a software I used to draw, right? So you can draw like things like this. Uh, let's say the vector that we're talking about just now, right? So a vector and then have an arrow, right? So it's too too small. And then the good thing about IPE is you can actually. Uh, use latex notation to do it so you got f right so you got f here and then uh, yeah so you can do all kinds of things over here you can even draw the angle for example uh, i can draw this angle like this right and then and then snap to this side 
and then you can say that uh, this angle is uh, theta. So you can you can do many many things with this, and then you can save as PDF. You can export as uh, PNG or save as PDF. Yeah, something like this. So IPE is very convenient. So yeah, so if my recommendation is IPE, but um, if you want easy, right? I think people use PowerPoint, right? Or, or Microsoft Word, that's fine. But it, it won't look as nice, right, if you use PowerPoint. Um, so, okay, yeah, so I will share the LaTeX code for, for this document. Uh, and, yeah, so it looks professional because I'm, I'm using the template which I use to publish papers. Uh, that's why it looks nicer. So uh, don't be stressed. Um, y if you are rushing, do, do something more simple. That's also fine. Okay. Any other question about the assignment? Yeah. If not, let us continue talking about uh, this thing. So we don't. Yeah, let me close all the IPE stuff. And let's continue talking about uh, the next example okay so the next example is 7.1.2 and what is 7.1.2 about is basically where are we okay we are in satellite motion already um, so geostationary orbit is basically the orbit where the satellite is staying above the earth the same spot of the earth at all times so what do we mean by this okay so is the geostationary orbit is this so let's say i have this location right and then i have a satellite that is orbiting over here so this is small m this is big m right so geostationary orbit means it's always above the same place at all times so when my earth has rotated to here right and then my mass will be now here okay so that means um, geostationary means it means that the period is well it's the same period of the earth rotation so 24 hours so t is 24 times uh, 60 minutes and 60 seconds if we are converting to SI units okay so this is the geostationary orbit right and then uh, yeah so we can already calculate the what is the radius of a geostationary orbit because we already have the formula right so the formula that we have that we have derived uh, is more convenient to use um, which one is the more convenient one yeah just might as well just use this right so the the period is just uh, 2 pi and then gm and then r to the power 3 over 2 okay so we we put in uh, 24 times 3 6 0 0 this one we know the value and then the mass of the earth is given okay so no need to memorize is given to be 5.9722 times 10 to the power 24 kg so you can use it to solve for r okay and then you get r is equals to uh, 4.22 times 10 to the power 7 meters so it's like 42 million meters or uh, 42200 kilometers so a geostationary orbit is this radius it's actually very very far away from the surface of the earth okay so that is the radius of the geostationary orbit okay so um, yeah, so this one just uh, this one is just to show you a number. So that's why I went a bit fast. It's not a very important example. Uh, what is probably more important and to to connect this concept with what we have been learning in chapter two, one and two is the relation between the big G and small G. Okay, so this is what we want to do next. Uh, G and G. Right, so remember what is G? G is 
meters per second. Um, yeah, I, some of you during the midterm wanted to use 10, right? You are, is it what you normally use in high school? So it's like pi equals to 4, uh, e equals to 3, right? And then this g is 6.67 something something times 10 to the power minus 11. Okay, so uh, yeah, so how do we calculate this, right? So let me connect these two concepts together. The radius is center of the mass to the surface, correct? Yes. Yeah, from the center of mass. Sorry. So uh, let me set up this thing first. So let me write this thing in chapter. In chapters one and two, uh, we use the weight. Is the force of gravity, and we assume it was constant. Right. So remember when we have a object, right? of mass m then the force of gravity is mg right so the the force due to gravity is mg and the g is the acceleration due to gravity so 9.0 meters per second squared okay so this was what we did in chapter 1 and 2 is because in these two chapter we are just considering system that we are near the surface of the earth but right now we're talking about planets and orbits right so we zoom out a bit further and we use newton's law of gravitation Okay, so let's go to Newton's law of gravitation. Um, uh, so, yeah, so shall we? I want to draw a picture, so I need some space. So, by Newton's law of gravitation, uh, force due to gravity is what? So it's given by this equation, right? So the force due to gravity, the magnitude, okay? So I'm just focusing on the magnitude first, is gmm over r squared. So as, um, yeah, so the radius of the Earth is from the center to the surface, right? Like this. Okay, so let's say right now, right? So let me try to compare these two cases, right? So just now we are near the surface of the Earth. The height from the surface is y. Okay, so the height from the surface of the from this surface is y, but the center of the Earth is over here. So then there's another distance over here, which is the actual radius of the Earth. So for this calculation, we are going to need this information about the Earth. So let us jot down the data. Mass of the Earth is big M, is five point nine seven two two times ten to the power twenty four kg. Uh, radius of the Earth, right, is the big R, okay, so big R E is 6.38 times 10 to the power 6 meters. So these are information that we know already, right? For, um, in fact, for the radius of the Earth, maybe you can calculate by the Dan Olsen camera method if you use the map and then try to get the angles correctly. You can sort of at least estimate the radius of the Earth, right? So um, then what is the force experienced by this object of mass m? So this mass m is the distance, the total distance from the center of the earth is r is equals to y plus r e. Do you agree? Right? So then we can actually calculate the force experienced by, uh, by the earth. So let us see, right? So over here we have r is y plus r e. Then uh, the force uh, of gravity experience by m is what? So you can draw the free body diagram, right? So it's just f, right? So it's f is equal to gmm over r squared. So let us do a calculation here. So the f experienced by the small m is just uh, gmm over r squared. Okay, so r square is this thing so let me write this out gmm over r square so it's y plus r e square okay let me check 9.81 yeah so actually yeah it's approximately 9.8 9.81 9.79 uh the answer that we'll get is actually 1.79 later yeah i'm recording right i'm recording Yes. So 
is because like if you are different like different location around the earth it will change slightly because of all the different factors involved so yeah so it's approximately 9.8 okay now so this is the thing that we want to do now uh, let me uh, factorize out re so gmm so if I take out re square so this becomes 1 plus y over re square okay so this one I'm gonna do some math uh, which is binomial expansion so let's look at this so gm m over r e square so this one is actually what this is 1 plus y over r e to the power minus 2 okay so what I'm going to do now is to do a binomial expansion on this factor Actually, this one is like a Taylor expansion, but um, you haven't learned Taylor expansion yet, I don't think. Uh, in calculus one, you will learn it later, right? Okay, so actually it should be more like Taylor expansion. The MAT one already know, right? Taylor expansion. So uh, I'm going to do a Taylor expansion for this. Okay, so just write out the first few terms. So F is equal to GMM over RE square, and then Taylor expansion is going to be looking like this. Okay, so uh, 1 minus 2y over re plus 3y squared over re squared and then dot dot dot. Oh no. Uh, yeah, don't worry. Um, it's, it's, it's only to convince you of something only, right? We won't be using this very often. So the reason why we do this is because, right, let's look at this picture if we are near the surface of the earth right then near the surface of the earth that means y should be a small number especially it will be small compared to re because earth is such a huge object right so it's such a huge object so like uh, like a normal building like 100 meter 20 uh, 200 meter just aeroplane height also these are few meters this is a few thousand kilometers so what I'm trying to say is that um, near the surface, uh, y is much, much smaller than re. In other words, y over re is a small number. Okay, so all these terms are negligible. if uh, y over re is small because y is a small number small number square even smaller this is small number power 3 even smaller so all these higher powers are negligible so then we have approximately approximately gmm over re square times 1 Okay, so now we can use Newton's law. So approximately, right? Okay, so uh, F is equals to mass times uh, acceleration. And then over here is GM M over RE square. I can cancel the two. So we conclude that the acceleration is GM M, GM over RE square. Okay, now see something happens if we put in the numbers g is 6.67 times 10 to the power 11 minus 11 and then the mass was 5.9722 times 10 to the power of 24 kg and then the radius of the earth is 6.38 times 10 to the power 6 ki uh, meter and then square right so if we calculate out this number right you're going to get this uh, 9.79 meters per second square okay so even the units will cancel nicely so let me write this one more time okay so since this is the fun thing yeah i should have put in the units correctly so this is a uh, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 meter cube kg minus 1 second minus 2 5.9722 times 10 to the power 24 the mass is in kg and then the radius is 6.38 times 10 to the power 6 meters right but you square so um yeah so so at the end of the day you get 
and then the meter cancel with the meter you get this and then uh, kg inverse cancel with this kg inverse and then you got second square okay so you got g so this is approximately the g acceleration due to gravity and this uh, this was true uh, for distances near the surface of the earth So when we are doing chapter 2, right, chapter 2, all the motion is like near the surface of the earth. So that's why we can use this equation. The acceleration due to gravity is a constant. Okay, so do you follow so far? Ignore small height. Yeah, basically, yes, that's what we did. Okay, so the conclusion is that um, so this is MA and then uh, the force due to gravity uh, we started with GMM over R square right and then it is approximately GM over RE square times M this is G right it's approximately MG uh, near the surface of the earth so how do we say um, Okay, but uh, over here, if you are far away from the Earth, must use the full formula. So, valid for any distance from Earth. Okay, and uh, when we when we go to here to here, right, we we do the Taylor expansion and then we ignore the other terms, and uh, is oh, is the ignoring them is only accurate if the if you are near to the surface of the Earth. So if this one is not small, right, then we cannot ignore. So if this one is not small, then this there are some extra terms over here, then it's not accurate anymore. But only when small, then yes, it's accurate. Okay. So, yeah, uh, do you follow so far? Does anyone have any question about this? So hopefully this is um, convincing uh, to connect, right? So in chapter 2, we are using mg, but right now you're using gmm over r square. They're actually the same equation. Actually, the mg is a approximation of this full equation over here. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Gloria, for all this link. Uh, the IPE I showed just now, you can download from here. And then... Yes, we gave a workshop. Uh, and the TIKZ is also another diagram drawing, but it's a bit more diff troublesome. Like you need to write a lot of uh, code for this. And then I have not tried as the work pro yet. Yeah, so this is very good. You have all the options to draw a diagram. How high Why have to be not considered small enough? Well, um, yeah, so um, just look at this ratio. So maybe a few hundred kilometers. So RE is uh, 6,000 plus kilometers. So I think once you are a few hundred kilometers, it's, it's, it's not too small already. Just see what is the height so that you get some numbers here. right? So if, if Y is, um, let's say, a few thousand kilometers, then you get 0 0.1 here. Uh, 0 0.1 times 2 here so uh, yeah it's a it's a continuous order of magnitude uh. so you usually as long as we are within a few hundred meters of the ground in fact 200 kilometers of the ground is still fine this is 6,000 kilometers so you just look at the numbers von Neumann used mental calculation to for Taylor series uh. wow yeah, I, I, yeah, I didn't hear about von Neumann, but the, the Gauss, he did he calculated the logarithm using hand, the log of a number, the digit by digit he calculated using hand. 
because yeah at the time of Gauss and maybe von Neumann uh, we didn't have all the smartphone calculator or scientific calculator yet right Nine. Yeah, so we should feel lucky today uh, that we have calculator and now software uh, code to cal calculate a lot of things. But right, last time everyone calculated everything by hand. Yeah. In fact, right about use um, well not mental calculation, but for like calculating Taylor expansion, projectile motion, the satellite orbits, right? If you watch the movie Hidden Figures, it's about the lady who calculated the, the, the rocket orbit and she did everything by hand. Yeah, so I wonder if anyone seen that movie before, Hidden Figures. It's quite a nice movie. So... Okay, uh, let's talk a bit about gravitational potential energy. So I'm going to talk a bit and then, yeah, I'll stop when we run out of time. We'll just continue in the next class. <laughs> yeah, you need this type of brain to, for, for uh, calculate this. Miss new calculation, we can use calculate midterm. Oh. Uh. Oh. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so if you want to learn how to draw diagram, we got to do a workshop here. So you can watch this video. Symbol that. Oh, okay. That's nice. Okay. So um, let us get started on this topic. We we'll probably won't finish it. We'll continue the rest later. But let's see how far we can go. Right. So we want to talk about a satellite of mass m. I don't know if I'm spelling satellite correctly. Uh, but we orbit around. Uh, I always say Earth lah, but it doesn't have to be Earth, right? A planet, any planet of mass big M. Okay, so this is where the vector might start to become confusing. So try to follow this carefully. Uh, right now, right, I want to put the, the big M at the origin. And then I draw the free body diagram for small m. So what's happening here is that this is my big M. And then at a distance r away in orbit, I have small m okay so let's see if you understand this situation correctly uh, my angle here is theta what is the force experienced by small m uh, free body diagram of small m okay so i have a small m what is the force experienced by small m Hmm. Oh, check your answer. Yeah, as long as uh, you can use it to check your answer, but uh, to show your calculation, you still need to show, right, in your solution. Um, so the force acting on small m, right, is pointing this way. Of course, right, for small m, the, the source is here, so it's in this direction. Okay, so how do you write the vector of the force experienced by small m. So this is the this is the part. Let's see whether you agree with me or not. Okay. So everyone agrees the magnitude is g this mass times this mass divided by the distance between the two of them, r square. But how about the direction? Okay. So the direction, if I write down the unit vector r like this, right? The unit vector r hat is pointing away from the origin. But the force is this way. So the magnitude is this length. The direction should be the negative of r hat. So r hat is on the origin. So this is the origin. Okay. So yeah. So let's see if anyone complains. Uh, 
or anyone have any question? I, I foresee some questions relating to this. So everyone okay with the negative sign here? Because um, this is new to everyone, right? It's cos theta i sine theta j. Explain again. Huh? Okay, so basically um, the force is a vector. Uh, magnitude is gmm over r square. No problem. What is the direction? Direction is pointing this way. Right? So it's pointing this way. Okay, so that means it is the opposite of r. My r hat is pointing to the opposite of this vector. So my direction is negative r hat. Right? So if I draw it like this, right, my direction is positive x, positive y, wrong. Right? I want down and to the left. So it's to the negative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Negative sign just means that object A and B got the negative actor. Yes. So, yeah. And, um, yeah, so the details is, before you reach the detail, right, we just need to understand what is the magnitude, what's the direction. I think that this part, everyone, is fine. Right, magnitude, GMM, R square, Newton's law, direction is this way, right? So the question now lies, math in mathem how do you write a mathematical symbol for the direction of this way? Okay, so this is theta, right? Uh, my unit vector, if I define it like this, is here. So I need to, it's pointing towards the origin, right? So, uh, positive uh, r hat points away from origin. So the negative points towards origin. Okay. So away from the origin is like this. And then towards the origin okay everyone agree with this uh, yeah so relative in the sense that um, it, it depends on where is your origin so I draw the origin where my big M is on the origin Okay, so compared to just now, where was just now? Huh? Just now is the small m is the origin. So it depends on who you put on the origin. So this one was my small m. Then if this is my origin, uh, the this mass free body diagram is here. Alright, yes. So just set decide on the origin. Once you set a good origin, then the rest you just follow only. Yellow. Okay. So this is the this is the tricky part. But once I think I'm I believe that once everyone is comfortable why I put it like this, why I draw this diagram, then after the rest will be just follow just follow the calculation only. Right? No need to think anymore. Now we just need to convince ourselves this is true. Once we agree with this, then the rest is just manipulate the equation only. Right? So this is why I'm stopping now and waiting for question. So I want to make sure everyone is okay with this. Then after after everything is fine, then the rest is just calculation. Okay? Remember what we want to do? We want to calculate the energy of the system. So we from here we want to derive the potential energy. Which, which means that I want to calculate the work done by gravity. Okay, so if everyone is okay, right? Uh, let us calculate the work done. Uh, yeah, it's the gravity is pulling towards. M, yes, correct.
correct? So this small m is being pulled towards big M, right? It's being pulled towards big M. Okay. So let us try to calculate the work done. Okay. So the work done involves some displacement. So let us suppose, right? Suppose uh, m uh, was moved from some initial distance, so r1, right? And then to another distance r2. And the only force experienced by n is under the gravity, so under the influence of the gravity of the big M. Okay, so my big M was here, right? And then, yeah, so uh, in final position here, initial position here. So the distance is R. Okay, so this is the initial position. And then my final position. So this distance is R2, this distance is R1. If we know the initial and final speed, yeah, yeah, exactly. We are, yeah, I was about to say the speed is V2, the speed is V1, and then we can use the conservation of energy, but we haven't derived the potential energy yet, right? So let us try to derive that. Okay, so the work done by gravity is what? So remember, right, the force experienced by M1, a uh, small m, is towards. Uh, is towards this thing okay so remember the equation I want to convince you that there is a minus sign right so the work done the general formula is the integral if you remember right is f dot dr dr is also another vector okay so I have shown you the big F already but how to get dr so if you remember, right, from chapter, was it 4, chapter 3, right, uh, the r vector is the position vector, so it's xi plus yj. But right now, it's not convenient to use x and y because it's in the radial direction. So we use the polar coordinate, so r cos theta i and then plus r sine theta j, okay? And then this is the radial motion. So radial motion, right, is being pulled towards the center, to pulled towards the big M. Okay. So as what is the displacement of the object? The displacement of the object will be reducing in R. So it's changing along, it's changing the distance R only. But the angle theta will be constant, right? So it will be constant, constant angle theta. Okay. So that means. Uh, we are talking about radial motion from, am I running out of time? Yeah, from R1 to R2. So that theta is constant. Okay. So, yeah, so I'll stop after I um, go write down the next line. So if this is constant, then what is the changes in R? Right, so changes is in R is theta is constant. So theta is constant. So I just need to do this, and then changes in R. Okay, so from here I got uh, cos theta i plus sine theta j, and then dr. And then this is something we recognize again. This is again the unit vector r hat. So my dr is r hat changes in the distance from the origin okay so there's so many different r's here right r vector r hat and magnitude r uh so yeah so i'm so i'm gonna leave everything here and let you try to process all this information for now uh and we're running out of time already so let you process within this few days we will continue on the wednesday right i'm sure you have many more questions about this integrate about uh correct yes yeah so that is what i'm going to do lah so um we'll have to do it on the wednesday yeah so you're right you're right we're going to do that next okay 
So any question? So if not, uh, yeah, then that should be all for today. Right, I, I will stop the recording.